So welcome everyone to our webinar on helping your students to glow and grow. We will be talking today about how to provide effective feedback to your students, to encourage them, to correct them, um, to help them make progress in their English learning. And I'm going to have Tanya start out today um, and talk about why we need to provide feedback. Good morning. Yes, the, provide, the feedback. First of all, God is our greatest encourager, right? He is the encourager. And so the goal of our hearts, right, is that he would speak um, in and through us. So let's read his word. First, we have Philippians 2, 1 through 4. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. From Philippians 2. So yes, this one, this scripture encourages me uh, in humility, of course, and that the encouragement that I receive can come from God as well, right? And then I'm to give that same and to look to the interest of others. And this is kind of the why and the how of encouragement and feedback. The next one from 1 Thessalonians 5.11 is, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Um, and this one also direction and that we are doing that but we're to build up instead of tear down and then death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit proverbs 18 21 so yeah just the significance of my words and what i say and don't say um, are really powerful and then a wholesome tongue is the tree of life Proverbs 15. So God does the growing. He gets it. And so he gets all the glowing as well. I cannot make anything grow. I cannot make a plant grow. I can want, I can plant it. I can, you know, purchase a seed. I can water it. I can pray for it. Right. But I, I did, I don't make it grow. Right. Um, so he, in the same way, he has placed the student in the student the capacity or the ability to grow, right? That I, as his or her teacher, can actually nurture and water. Uh, I am blessed to be a blessing, and that's what is really important. I also have the privilege of being a leader to one who submits him or herself to teaching of another. And that's super important. Uh, that it's the, the really that just knowing that the student is really trusting the teacher and all that the teacher says or the two. So practically for me, this looks like a lot of investment and engagement through prayer, my words and actions and my inaction. Um, so I need to also look at my own growth in these two for my students. All right. I think we can go next. Okay. Uh, that's Melina, right? Yes. No? Okay. One of the techniques that we're going to be talking about to help us build up and encourage our students is called glow and grow. Um, and so 
to to glow means to um, to shine, to have a light. <laughs> And as we are encouraging our students and telling them what they are doing right, um, they often, their, their faces will smile, they will light up, they will beam. Um, and so, so this sense of helping them to glow and be encouraged and be positive about their, their learning is what we refer to with, with that word glow. Um, and then growing to help them grow, we're also going to point out things that they can improve on because beginning English learners make many errors um, as everyone does when they are learning a new task. And by correcting them and giving them guidelines and showing them the right way to do it, we're helping them grow in the right direction. So as we respond to our student assignments, sometimes we can um, be at loss what to say, how to help them. And so uh, uh, just this little technique is try to point out at least two things that they're doing well um, and one thing that they can improve on. And we'll be giving some examples of that. Um, it's important that we are not just focusing on the things that they do wrong, but giving them encouragement and helping them to glow as well. So one of the things, too, I will say is these are different kinds of praises that can be looked at as well. I cannot say that I do all of this in my own tutoring. So please take what works for you and leave the rest, right? Uh, what's one way that you can, you know, kind of just add to your ongoing uh, teaching as well. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of material, a lot of good ideas, but what works for you and your student is most important. So we have three kinds of praise that you can look at and say, okay, what will work the best? We have a personal praise, we have an effort-based praise, and then we have a behavior-specific praise. So the personal praise focuses on natural talents or skills that come easily rather than with effort. Something like you have beautiful penmanship and like it's the first day of school or they just began. This kind of praise is, is good. It will provide students um, some acknowledgement of what, what is going well. Um, the, the research shows that it's not necessarily the star is a little smaller because sometimes it can fall a little bit short. Uh, it, can, um, it can make students feel like their abilities are outside of their control. It's just kind of something that came naturally to them. But then again, if you, the student might have worked years ahead to work on that penmanship, and the teacher doesn't know because they only get them at one point. So um, it's, it's a good kind of praise to give, but it's not one that should be the only kind of praise, right? So it's kind of having a, a mixture of different kinds of praise. Uh, so yeah, the, the, if, if it's acknowledged just as a natural ability or talent, they might not think they have control and that they can improve on it or not. Uh, okay, so let's go with the effort-based praise. This is something in one's control. The time spent and strategies used are in a student's control. For example, an effort-based praise is I am impressed with your dedication you have towards your homework study. So regardless of the performance, this, this values the effort that they have put in. So, or another comment for effort-based praise is excellent work on completing your homework, right? Or this brings glory to God, right? Just completing it, 
putting, investing oneself into it. Uh, another kind of uh, effort-based comment would be, you shine strength and perseverance in your memory work. So this is more of that, yeah. Or your sentences reflect your growth in learning. They are, they are more full. It, it's interesting because depending on the student and what you can actually say in your praise, right? It can be very limited. But the effort base, uh, when a student's efforts are realized, through praise, a student is encouraged because the student has invested themselves wisely, him or herself wisely. It's something within their control. And I would have to say, I am number one on effort-based praise as a student. I, I think that um, I, I would always give myself an A for effort. Now, the performance, not quite sure about, right? But, um, and actually, my performance wasn't very good. But I think the effort-based praise is really key. That's why the star is a little bit bigger. And it's something that a person can actually do and be accepted for and know that they're going in the right direction. So this the behavior-specific praise lets student know that they, what they are doing correctly. Great job finishing the, the homework, all of the homework activities, right? Uh, the thing about praise is also to be very specific, right? And and what, what you're saying, good job is great, but what did I just do a good job at, right? Good job in, uh, in pronounce, you know, pronunciating something, good job in reading, uh, good job in listening. So being specific helps out tremendously as well. So uh, the next slide is about, this is a uh, fruitful praise. So first of all, be sincere, 100% the most important, right? Uh, being sincere from the heart and something that you can, the students will know, right? We all know when, when somebody's not sincere. Uh, yeah. And I, I realized this when I was young. I said, like, I don't think you're sincere. <laughs> so I didn't really believe people when they would say something. It was like, oh. I, because I just, yeah. So insincere praise can make students doubt the tutor and wonder why you're not telling the truth, right? Um, as believers, we speak the truth in love and uh, yeah, we don't need to speak anything outside of that. The be specific, right? Being specific about the comments so that the student knows what to repeat and what to continue with. Instead of good job, try good job with your reading new words in the Bible study today, which is a fabulous thing that people do, trying to figure out new words based on the sounds and the syllables that they've already learned. Um, takes a great amount of courage to do that. Next one is recognize the effort, the attempt, and the work. Focus the comments on how much effort students put in. And this values what students can control rather than the skills that might come naturally to them. These are some of my um, words that I like to use, like productive or fruitful or effective reading or effective homework, uh, constructive, rich, profitable, it's a good investment, helpful or beneficial. And so I just looked these up on the internet and said synonyms for, you know, productive. So I'm not using the same words all the time, but some of these, 
And once again, depending on the tutor's, the student's ability to understand these words will determine like if you just say rich, right? Something or helpful, right? Something that's a little bit more approachable for them to understand. And the next one is praise the process, not just the outcome, right? Uh, recall their previous successes as well as the current one. A good review of how far they've actually come, where they started from, how something was difficult in the beginning, but now they do it with ease, right? That can be sounds, that can be sentences, it can be remembering to put punctuation in. So yeah, this helps the students to see their growth and how far they've actually come so that they can value their investment in time and effort that they've done. And this also reinforces the process and encourages them in their goal to speak or write English or any goal. And then avoid overpraising. And like when I was writing some of these slides, I'm like, going, okay, <laughs> I need to put some of these things into practice. Like, Overpraise. Um, I I will have to say that I think some of my with some of my students I'm overpraising, and so I I need to to stop. I can just be sincere and uh, let them walk through. So, do you have any examples about a sincere praise, or should we save questions for the end, Malik? If you have a question now, you can unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, we will have more time for discussion at the end. Okay. 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 Well, then let's go with the next. Time. Okay. So these are some of the comments that you can give your students as you're encouraging them, um, being very specific. So we can say things like, I like how you speak clearly when you are reading the Bible story, or this is good because you made sure that the verb agrees with the subject. Um, excellent job on completing all of your homework assignments, right? They may not have them all correct, but they completed them all. Or excellent job on your perfect attendance. Um, those students who are reliable, who show up to class every time, we want to let them know that. As they are telling us stories or writing, we can say, I love the way you included details about your family in this description. Or I'm impressed by the way you are comfortable talking in front of the class. Um, you did a good job with your punctuation on these sentences. The best thing about your work is how you complete everything and you are so careful to go back and double check it. Um, or I enjoy your stories because they make me laugh. Um, so just just coming up with with different aspects, as Tanya was saying, we may be um, praising their skill, their behavior, uh, but these are some different ways that we can do it. Again, I know I sometimes get in the habit of just saying the same phrases all the time. I'll say, good job, <laughs> or um, nice work. But as we are using more complex vocabulary with our students, it helps them learn more words as well. And so as they're progressing, we're gonna be giving increasingly more complex feedback. 
Yes. Glowing includes growing, right? If we just glow all the time, we're not, we don't have an investment in, and uh, making errors is a natural part of learning. That's what we do. We're making attempts. We're trying, giving construction, constructive instruction can be challenging since we know at some level that we fall short of the glory of God. Many like to hear the word, uh, the good one. Many like to hear the good one has, the good a person has done. Yet, who defines the good, right? When left to our own self-evaluation, if we don't recognize things, people are either too hard or too soft, and they miss the mark. So as tutors, we have reasonable expectations, right? Based on the student's abilities and gifts. And there's always the grow part. If we just recognize just the good, students may come to not believe and trust a tutor because people know that they are, um, that something is wrong and they are looking for the right, right? In our other core. So let's see, remember too, if you, as an adult learner trait, adult students learn faster, but forget faster, right? So even remembering something would be a good thing to acknowledge. Uh, adult learners are also afraid of embarrassment. They're more sensitive and they want immediate progress. So recognizing, um, any kind of progress would be very important. Adults must believe they can learn. That's a good, that's, that's an important thing and that we want to teach them. Show them that we are glad to help them grow and learn. Yeah, that, that fear of embarrassment, being wrong, not getting it right. Those are all not a, the kingdom that we're part of, right? We are part of the kingdom that we know we need to grow and we desire to grow. So giving them part, yeah, demonstrating that will help. So for example, when we ask them to listen and they actually listen, it means that we have given them the expectation and they have succeeded in listening, which is very hard to do in a foreign language. It takes a lot concentration. When we say listen and repeat, they do. And they have, we have set expectations and they are successful. So overall, recognizing more of what is being accomplished will help us with our praise. What exactly are they having to accomplish in this? Uh, yeah. Oh, next slide. Yeah, and thank you, Tanya, for bringing up embarrassment. Um, one thing that I have found is that students are sometimes very embarrassed when other students in the class correct them. Um, so they may be willing to accept correction from the teacher, but when someone else in the class points out their mistakes, um, depending on the way that it is done and who is doing it, that can cause embarrassment to them. Um, so I will often tell my students that the rule is I will correct people if they make a mistake. Um, you don't need to point out the mistakes of your neighbors. I, I remember especially I had one class where I had a husband and wife in the class and the wife was more advanced than the husband and she was constantly correcting him, correcting him. Um, and that became discouraging for him. But also many times when the students attempt to correct one another, they're not right. Um, they're giving wrong information. And so it, it can be detrimental. 
So there is a time and a place for pairing weaker learners and stronger learners, but um, we do want to make sure that that's not something that's making the students feel uncomfortable or embarrassed. So an important thing to remember in giving feedback is we don't need to correct every single error that our beginning students make. Um, they become overwhelmed <laughs> by all of the corrections. And so it's more helpful if we focus on one area at a time that we would like them to improve. Um, so here's an, a sample sentence. A beginner student might write, the book white on table. And if we look at this sentence that they've written, uh, we can see there are a lot of errors. Um, there's not a capital letter at the beginning. There's not a punctuation mark at the end. The word is is missing. Um, the word book and white should be transposed with having the word white first and then book. Um, most of the words are spelled incorrectly. So um, how can we look at a sentence like this and make some um, constructive feedback for the student without completely destroying them? Uh, we don't want to take out our red pen and just mark it all up. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. Um, what I will tend to do is one way that I give um, correction is by modeling the correct way to do it. Uh, so if a student says to me, the book white on table, I would say, yes, the white book is on the table, right? So I say yes to indicate that I understand what they're trying to communicate. Um, and then I model the correction by repeating what they have said with correct grammar. So yes, the book white is on the table. All right. Um, instead of saying, no, the book white is on the table, it's yes, yes, good job. I understand you. The, the white book is on the table. Um, as we're doing these corrections, then we, we want to focus on correcting the kinds of things, um, number one, that have a systematic rule that the students can follow because so many things in English um, have exceptions or just seem sort of random. Why, why do we do it this way? So if we can find a, a consistent rule to point out, that's a good teaching point. So what I would probably do with a student who wrote this sentence is I would say, um, good, the white book is on the table. Remember, we need to start our sentence with a capital letter. And then I would, I would show them instead of a small T, we would start it out with a big T. Capital letter always goes at the beginning of the sentence. And then I would have them um, on all their other homework sentences go through and make sure they have a big letter at the beginning of each sentence, right? And once they get that down and they understand that, um, then we could go to another rule, which is sentences always have a punctuation mark at the end and showing them um, you know, we will put a period, a full stop at the end of this sentence because it's a complete idea. Um, and again, just take one thing at a time. Um, capital letters, that's, that's consistent. Punctuation at the end, that's consistent. We can then teach the rule that adjectives generally come before a noun. Um, but 
one, just one rule at a time. Once they get it done, then the next lesson we can focus on another rule. Um, another thing I do a lot is I try to prompt students to correct their own mistakes because very often they know the rule, it's in their head, they know what they're supposed to do, but they are not producing it consistently. So after they've learned the rule about putting a big letter at the beginning of the sentence, they may still periodically forget to do that. Um, and so instead of telling them it's useful to ask them, what do we need at the beginning of a sentence? And they'll go, oh yeah, 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 right. I need a capital letter. And they'll change it and put in the capital letter. What do we need at the end of the sentence? Oh yes, yes, we need a period at the end of the sentence. So they, they know it in their heads. They are just not consistently producing it yet. And so that can be really helpful to ask them questions and prompt them to make their own corrections. Or, you know, look at this sentence. Do you see something missing? They might look at it and say, oh, I'm missing the word is. I need to write the word is. Um, or how does the verb change in the past tense? So you are writing a sentence about yesterday or you're talking about yesterday. How do we change this verb to make it the past tense? So again, um, if they've already learned this, they just need a little reinforcement to begin doing it consistently. Yes, be clear about expectation. Uh, yes, students need to know the expectations of the homework or even the less, you know, the lesson time. With these being known, students can grow in a, you know, their own self-evaluation. Also, tutors know what to evaluate right, and what not to engage in. Um, trying to make everything perfect, as Melina has said, and, and thus end up discouraging students with the unknown expectations. Like if you're working on the verbs at that particular time, right, then that would be something definitely to state like in their, uh, in their homework, okay, today we learned about these verbs, right? Make sure in your homework that you're looking for this. So the expectation. By setting reasonable goals for students, a tutor lets them know what he or she will be looking for in their work, right? And then you can do this at the end of the lesson. And also, I find that expressing it in a follow-up email where students can actually translate some of those more difficult instructions or even um, yeah, directions and instructions into their own language. So to review homework expectations can be, I'll be looking for punctuation marks in your homework today when you turn that. Or the grammar learned or learning is a really important word, learning. Um, any spelling challenges that they have. Uh, penmanship, right? I, I, uh, some of, one of my students, I can't really necessarily decipher some of their letters. Uh, maybe it's due dates. I want to make sure you turn in your homework on Monday, not Tuesday when we meet in class. And then the what else can also be what the student wants to work on, right? So what is one thing the student is looking to uh, practice in this next homework? And having them vocalize that will help out a lot too. Yeah, the more that we can, and the more that the student can actually talk about what they're learning, the more a student will learn, right? That, that is just part of the process. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the next slide.
And one of the things I wanted to uh, mention, which is a useful tool mm -hmm. for students to evaluate themselves as well as you to evaluate their performance is um, the final homework slide in the light of the world materials is now I can. And it sums up the, the grammar um, and vocabulary and Bible study and lesson theme. So these are the things that the student should have learned during the lesson. And we ask students to check those off um, if they feel confident that they can do them. Or, um, you know, if they don't, just to circle it or put a question mark up on it. And we know those are things that they need to work on some more. So for this one, um, this is from our, our A229 lesson. I can talk about different body parts and senses. I can understand, say, read and write the 12 vocabulary words. I can use the simple past tense. I can pronounce and spell regular past tense verbs. Um, I can understand how Jesus was tempted in the desert. So if they have questions about those and they might say, oh, I still don't understand that Bible story or um, I'm still not sure how to pronounce those regular past tense verbs, then that's something you can discuss and work on in your next session. Um, but, but I encourage students to use this, this tool for self-evaluation and then it also helps us make sure we've covered everything they should have learned in the lesson. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for putting that in there, Marlena. That's the perfect evaluation for expectations and, and taking notes because growing takes notes. Get to know your students. Right. We have a, a tutor. A tutor's noting a student's programs is essential to their growing. Uh, looking at the details of the needs and the successes of the punctuation, the grammar, memory work, homework. Like yesterday, it was the first time that my students ever participated in a song after 37 lessons and a year of being with them. The head and shoulders, knees and toes got them. So super excited about that. So be patient, be patient, keep you know waiting, but keeping notes of the, the corrections and recognizing the successes uh, of them for future lessons. Uh, yeah. So a lot of times I think recognizing successes and just the little things like uh, you, you overcame the, the uh, technology, right? The internet, You're like remembering the days when we had troubles or, Look at how much we've grown is, I think, super important. Oh, okay. So let's see, we have take notes and address mistakes later using your own sentences, like Melina had showed as well, with the same kinds of mistakes and say, okay, well, what's going on here? Because they expect the teacher, right, to make it perfect. But if you write something that's not and say, okay, so it puts them in that learning position, that teaching position. Not that they're going to teach you, but it is important to have uh, feedback like that, but it helps them to grow. Uh, correct with repetition, with the correct sentence, phrase, or word. Now keep bringing it in, maybe lesson after lesson at the beginning or end of a lesson, or noting it in the lesson. Provide simple examples to correct the error, especially with grammar and pronunciation. And then also look at, find out the nature of the error. So, you know, the TH pronunciation could be one that's kind of hard to, to speak. And I was like, okay, well, they don't really have that sound in their language. So I understand. And we just keep working on it. I don't, you know, say, you got to get it right today or I'm not moving on. So taking notes, taking notes. Okay, Malia. All right. Um, some of the, the grow comments that we can use are, I like to give 
people um, examples. Like we don't say book white because in English, the description comes before the thing. So we say white book. Um, so just instead of saying, no, it's white book, not book white, tell them why, tell them the rule, tell them the reason for this, if there is a reason. Sometimes there's no reason and we just have to say, that's just the way it is in English, um, but often there's a rule. And give them little tips. Uh, it may help to do this instead of this. So it may help when you're making the TH sound to stick out your tongue a little bit farther and go, you know, do an exaggerated movement. Um, or I'm noticing that you are not saying the last letter of each word. So make sure you're enunciating that last letter. Um, or one suggestion I have is after you write your, your, your paragraph, go back and make sure you have periods at the end of every sentence, capital letters at the beginning. So no one writes perfectly the first time, but we need to check it and check it again uh, to try to find those mistakes. Or be sure you remember to put an S at the end of the verb if the subject is he, she, or it. Um, that's something I've probably said a million times over my career. Um, that third person S is, is so challenging. And um, one thing you can do if, if there's a mistake that your students often make, you could put up a little uh, poster in your classroom or um, a, even a, a sticky on your computer screen. And then just instead of correcting them, just point at that. So I'll do that with the third person S when they say, he say, instead of he says, or um, she go, instead of she goes. I'll just point to the S and that's on the wall. And that then they go, oh yeah, 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 yeah. She goes, she goes with an S. Um, so they, they do, again, there's, there's often a gap between what we know how to do and what we do consistently. Um, in general, we want to give more positive than negative feedback. If we're only pointing out what the students are doing wrong, they get discouraged. Um, and especially for beginning learners, they need a lot of praise in the beginning to get them feeling um, encouraged, confident, to keep on trying. So a, a rule of thumb is you should be able to give your, your learner um, about five positive comments for each correction you make. And if not, you may be going through the material too quickly. So if, if they are, if you're constantly having to correct, you know, every word they're saying is wrong or every word they're writing is wrong, you may have to slow down because you're trying to push them too quickly or change your delivery method. Try explaining it in a different way because they're not getting it. Right, so um, our students are giving us feedback by their performance, just as we are giving them feedback. And so if we see that they're really struggling with something, they're not keeping up, I need to look at myself as a teacher. Am I trying to push them too fast because I'm bored with this lesson um, and I wanna go on to the next thing? Uh, teachers tend to get bored with the material before their students do, um, or, is it possible they're just not understanding the way I'm explaining this? I need to find a new way to explain it, a new way to show them how to do this to help them get it. 
So um, teachers need feedback from our students too in order to become better teachers. Um, and this is, this is hard because in many cultures, it's not polite to question a teacher, even when they make a mistake or correct a teacher. Um, it's not polite to criticize a teacher, but we do want our students to know that we are open to their feedback. And so I always encourage my students to ask me questions and offer me feedback. Um, often when I'm writing things on the board, um, it's easy to make a mistake as you're writing things out on the board. So you can, uh, usually it's my unintentional mistake, but as Tanya said, you can also use intentional mistakes. If a student um, catches you making a mistake and tells you, you know, excuse me, teacher, you didn't put a period at the end of that sentence. Um, I sometimes I will give my students a piece of candy <laughs> because they found a mistake that I made. Or if they ask a question, you know, does anyone have any questions? And there's just silence. Um, if somebody does ask a question, I'll, you know, give them a, a little piece of candy or some sort of a reward for that, especially in the beginning so that they see, okay, this is a good thing to do. Asking questions is a good thing. Um, and when they ask questions, I always say, thank you for asking. That's a great question. Encourage them because very often they're afraid to ask. They don't want to look dumb. They don't want to um, feel inadequate. But if you say, thanks for asking, that's a great question. If one student in the class asks a question, there's a good chance a lot of the other students were thinking the same thing, but they didn't ask. And that's a clue that I need to clarify and go over that point a little bit. I also teach my students phrases such as, can you repeat that? So when I say something and they don't understand it, they know to say, can you please repeat that? Or please slow down, slow down a little bit. This is something they need to know not only in the classroom, but outside the classroom as they have real life conversations. We often have to ask people to slow down. Um, and asking what does blank mean? So just, just having that vocabulary so that when they hear an unfamiliar word, they can, can say, you know, what does feedback mean? What does culture mean? Um, and so we can start to talk about the things they don't understand. But we can really learn a lot from our students' feedback. At the end of the course, um, if my students are able, depending on their ability level, I'll give them a feedback survey. What did you like about the class? What would you like to change about the class? Um, you know, what do you like about your teacher? What can your teacher do better? And based on that feedback, you are able to improve your own teaching and um, continue to grow. I usually call those surveys um, smile sheets because most of the time students will say, everything's great. I love the class. Don't change anything. Um, and again, that's part of a cultural expectation Students are um, uncomfortable telling their teachers if they're doing something wrong. So when you do get that negative feedback, you really need to pay attention to it because that takes a lot of courage for a student to say, you know, um, the teacher's instructions are not clear or she talks too fast or I wish the class would um, end on time or something like that. We can always learn from that. 
terrific input, Melina. So overall, the most important thing, of course, is seeking the Lord for our students, for ourselves, for the class, for, for everything, right? Pray about everything. So pray because since God knows our students very well, pray since God loves our students very well as well. And pray since God grows and glows in their in their learning. He is He is the greatest encourager. He is He is the the you know the Holy Spirit is the teacher. And so uh so so very important. So uh I was gonna say a prayer uh for our students today. <laughs> so if I can do that real quick. The next slide we can show afterwards, but let me go ahead and, and pray. And it comes from uh, Psalm 19.4. Okay. So Father God, thank you for this time to evaluate and to grow in feedback for uh, those that you put in our care. Thank you that we have the desire to do, uh, to show your love to them. Lord, I ask for each one of us that the, the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be pleasing in your sight. I ask that you will uh, you know, take what is important for each person here to put into practice, and then the other part can just float away. But that you would all get the glory in the growing and in the glow. And we thank you, Jesus. Amen. And then the next slide is, uh, there's a handout on that first site, The Power of Praise. And it comes with the handout that's on the left-hand side. And uh, so this is some of the, you know, my own experience teetering and providing feedback. Um, and then as well as some of these sites too, that provides more or review what I've covered in the slides. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tanya, for this. And um, this is a, this will soon be available. We're going to post it in the PowerPoint slide that's attached to your webinar invitation. So if you just click on the um, the presentation link that we include with your webinar invitation, you'll get copies of all of this. So thank you so much, Tanya. I really appreciate this. And I'm going to stop recording now, and then we'll take a moment for some, some question and answers. <laughs>